His personality was reserved and unassuming, and yet he was monarch over the largest empire the world has ever seen. When the war came, he saw his duty as the face of determination for his people, King George V. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War Bio special episode about George V, King of the United Kingdom and the British Dominions and Emperor of India. George was born June 3, 1865, during the 64-year reign of his grandmother, Queen Victoria. George Frederick Ernest Albert was the second son of the Prince and Princess of Wales, the future King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. In 1871, he and his older brother Albert Victor, whom the family called Eddie, were entrusted to the care of the tutor Reverend John Neil Dalton, who would form a lifelong friendship with both boys. There does seem to be a certain lack in their education, though, as neither ever learned a foreign language, unusual for a monarch at the time, and misspellings, poor grammar, and syntax errors appeared in George's correspondence and journals for his whole life. George as the second son of the Prince of Wales, was not in direct line for succession. So almost from the moment of his birth, it had been decided that he would make a career in the Navy. George was 12 years old when he joined the Royal Navy together with Eddie. En route, he and his brother each acquired three tattoos, including a red and blue dragon on their arms. Yep, the king with the dragon tattoo. Soon after Eddie went to Cambridge, George continued in the Navy. George was actually quite a capable young commander, first of Torpedo Boat 79 in home waters, and then of the HMS Thrush, based in Halifax in 1891. The following year, Eddie came down with influenza and died, the day before his 28th birthday and a month before his marriage. George was now in direct line of succession to the throne, and his naval career was suddenly over. Created a duke, he had some official duties, though the most important role of an heir to a hereditary monarchy was to marry and to reproduce. Queen Victoria sidestepped the possible lengthy process of finding a mate for George by strongly suggesting that he marry Eddie's former fiancée, Mary, the Princess of Teck. Princess Mary was the granddaughter of the Duke of Württemberg. Now, he had married a countess, but According to succession laws, she was viewed as non-royal, so the marriage was morganatic. Despite this, George married Mary, who was also his second cousin once removed, June 6, 1893. The couple moved into York Cottage. Thing is, his mother Alexandra and her three daughters were not welcoming to Mary. Much of the court also looked down on Mary because of her common blood. So Mary withdrew into herself and the two lived a quiet life in the country more like the upper middle class than royalty. Queen Victoria died in 1901 and Edward VII succeeded her as king. George, now the Prince of Wales and direct heir to the throne, spent much of the next decade touring the empire. He was particularly troubled by the casual racism he saw in India and for the rest of his life took an active interest in Indian affairs. As king, he would return to India for a durbar, a king's court of formal and informal meetings with his subjects, and during the first few months of the war, he allowed the Royal Pavilion at Brighton to be converted into a hospital for wounded Indian soldiers. In fact, his somewhat egalitarian attitude was one of the first things George brought to his reign when Edward died in 1911 and George became King George V. For example, he refused to make the traditional accession declaration until the anti-Catholic rhetoric that had been part of it since 1689 was removed. As king, George continued to enjoy his favorite pastimes of stamp collecting and hunting. Many courtiers were irked that he did not continue most of the grand social events of his father. On August 4th, 1914, on the advice of his ministers, King George V declared war on Germany. Crowds outside Buckingham Palace cheered. George's reserved social life was fairly well suited to the demands of the war, though his ministers implored him to show more optimism. He responded that, we sailors never smile while on duty. He never minded being thought glum and remarked of his wartime activities, I do things because they are my duty, not as propaganda. He deplored 
many of the methods of modern war, calling Zeppelin raids on Britain simple murder. As for German submarines sinking merchant vessels, he said, it is disgusting that naval officers could do such things. He really believed that Britain should retain the moral high ground, and when British ships flew the flag of the neutral US to avoid attack, he said he'd rather sink under his own colors. He also, perhaps because of his own German heritage, tried to protect his subjects of German extraction or bearing German names. Despite his efforts, Admiral Prince Louis of Battenberg was forced to resign as First Sea Lord by public opinion about his Austrian and German background. Lord Haldane, who had actually formed and organized the British Expeditionary Force, the Territorial Army, and the General Staff, was also forced to resign because of comments he made in 1912 about Germany being his spiritual home since attending university there four decades earlier. George's efforts might have been more successful had he done more on separating the British monarchy from German relations at war with it. He was opposed to removing the Kaiser and his family as honorary commanders of the British units they were actively engaged in fighting against. And pretty much everyone was shocked when he said Prince Albert of Schleswig-Holstein was not really fighting on the side of the Germans since he had only been put in charge of a camp of British prisoners. So there were plenty of people who questioned George's loyalty to Britain. George was offended by such questions. When H.G. Wells called his court alien and uninspiring, George said, I may be uninspiring, but I'll be damned if I'm alien. In 1917, George changed the name of his family from saxe coburg gotha to Windsor, which it remains today. In response, the Kaiser said that he was going to attend the opera The Merry Wives of saxe coburg gotha which is pretty funny, you know? I mean, Kaiser Wilhelm usually isn't actually that funny, so that was a pretty good one. Anyhow, the king's relatives also got anglicized names. Louis of Battenberg became Louis Mountbatten, for example. Over the course of the war, George would make 450 visits to his troops, 300 to hospitals, and over 200 to munitions factories. He personally awarded over 50,000 decorations. His family would serve as well. His son, the future King Edward VIII in the army, and his son, the future King George VI in the navy. His health began to be negatively affected by all the travel though, and he even broke his pelvis after being thrown from a horse during an inspection in France in 1915. By 1918, his suffering took a notable physical toll. Still, apart from his public appearances, his role in the decision-making and the planning of the war was very limited. He actually saw himself as a constitutional monarch, more as a mediator and he did express his opinions regularly to the prime ministers of the day. Asquith valued his advice, like removing John French as commander-in-chief. Lloyd George mostly ignored it. George was very much opposed to offensives away from the Western Front. East Africa, Salonika, Gallipoli, Mesopotamia were for him distractions. He was quite happy when his old friend Sir Douglas Haig succeeded John French as commander, and he stood by Haig throughout the war. When peace came, he was overjoyed, and he and Queen Mary waved to the crowds from the balcony at Buckingham Palace night after night. He never forgave his cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm, for the war, and thought he should be tried for his role in the outbreak of hostilities. And the post-war years didn't bring George much peace. He was horrified by the carnage in Ireland, the civil lists were reduced, which brought on a financial crisis for the royal family, that the Commonwealth was formed, on and on. Life kept rolling. All of that is well beyond the scope of this channel, though. King George V took to his bed January 15, 1936. On the 20th, seeing that he was near death, his doctor, Lord Dawson, without consulting the royal family, gave him a lethal dosage of morphine and cocaine just before midnight. This was so his death would be reported in the morning edition of the Times and not the less appropriate evening journals. His legacy is simple. Unlike most of the other monarchies of Europe post-war, his survived. His simple tastes and simple lifestyle were much more relatable to his subjects than the extravagance of his father. And King George V saw the role of king as a duty and his role in a constitutional monarchy as a private voice of advice to his ministers and as a quiet face of determination to his people. 
I'd like to thank Skylar Ingram and Elbert Pham for helping with the research for this episode. Now, if you want to learn more about another monarch leading his country through World War I, you can click right here to see our episode about Belgium's King Albert I. Check out our subreddit for all kinds of cool information and community debates about World War I. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.